Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Capital Bible Church. We're about to begin our study on our course on basic training feed field manual. But before we do, let's pause for a moment of silence and exercise 1 John 1 9, which gives us the opportunity to get back in fellowship with God. So let's pause for prayer, and then I'll open in prayer. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity for us to assemble together as believers in Christ, those online and those in person. If there's anything vying for our attention, I pray that we would lay those aside for the moment so that we can focus on our study. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you have your booklet, uh, we're on page four, and I'm just going to hit the high points, and I'm going to, oh, what happened? Let's see. Yeah, it stopped mirroring, so let me try this again. Yeah, no, you have to. some reason it's those on zoom just give us a moment we're having a little technical difficulty at the moment so that will do it back on all right let's um we're on page four but i'm also going to have it on the screen for those online and in person on page four we're looking at ambassadorship so i just want to comment on one section here number seven an ambassador is a personal representative of someone else and he's referring to us as believers in christ But notice he says, um, everything he does and says reflects on the one who sent him. So as you go through the book, he has several things here with regards to ambassadorship. And I'll not spend time on this because I have my own thoughts on ambassadorship. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. This is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at 16 to about 20, 21, 16 to 21. And this is under the subject of ambassadorship, page four on Pastor Gene's booklet. So reading from verse 16 on, 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. And I want you to think in your mind, ambassadorship, okay? Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed, old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That's verse 17. Verse 18, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are, what's the word here? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore, that word is beg, we urge you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I want to I hit this 
in a few angles, and I just want to see what you have to say as well, your thoughts. But I want to bring to your attention verse 17 specifically. We've all have heard this verse before. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed, and all things have, behold, all things have become new. What does this mean? What have you heard this? What have you heard people say about this verse before? Right, we're a new creation. And so what does that actually mean, Rick? That means we're adopted into the royal family of God. Okay, we're adopted into the royal family of God. Very good. And, uh, you know, we received the embodiment of the three members of the Trinity. I don't know if that means then. Mm -hmm. I would, I would say it would, because we're a new creation in him, in Christ. So that's the only way we can have the indwelling. In him, in Christ, that there's that word, that preposition in, referring to positional truth. That takes place only in the church age, right? So anyone who is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, has anybody ever heard a person say, well, you know, old things have passed. We have no more sin. We don't sin anymore. I remember... <clears throat> This is no joke. I was on the campus of Biola. And one guy came up to me and said, you know what? I wasn't a pastor back then. And we were a part of this Bible club on uh, Biola. And he said, you know, it's nice because I don't sin anymore. And he cited this verse. And he said, look, it says he's a new creation. Old things have passed. And behold, all things have become new. So therefore, we don't sin anymore. And I said, well, you make God a liar then, according to 1 John. And he said, well, explain this. I spent a little time with this guy, talking to him about it. But people like those who believe in, it's called, uh, give me a second here. Reincarnation. <laughs> Reincarnation. Yeah, it could be, but there's a, there's a term I'm thinking of. Anyone who's in Christ. Very popular in the Reformed camp. Uh, give me a moment here. Anyways, let's start from... Oh, here we go again. Not sure why we are having some fun here tonight, but that'll give me a chance to rebound and have fun putting this back on track here. So did that go back? Yeah. Very good. All right, let's go back to this. <clears throat> so please notice, we'll just hit the verse, verses here. There you go. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're a new creation in Christ. And so there's a heavy emphasis on stressing our position in him. And old things have passed and all things have become new. And so they equate verse 17 to involve primarily their new position in Christ. And I'd like to suggest that Verse 17 is not more about the inness or position in Christ, but rather how we view people. If you look at verse 16, therefore from now on we regard no one according to the what? Flesh. To the flesh. So we don't look at people the way that we used to prior to regeneration. So Paul is saying, therefore, because we're in Christ, and we're a new creation, old things have passed, we don't look at people the way that we used to. Verse 16. So when he gets to therefore, we have to ask, why is it therefore? And it's because of 16. Right? So 16 says, if anyone is in Christ, and we are in Christ, he is a new creation, old things have passed, old things have become, all things have become new, and the all things becoming new... I believe it's referring to how we view people, how we look at people now. And the reason why 
is because as this unfolds, what is he going to try to encourage us to do? He wants us to be ambassadors. ambassadors. How can we be an ambassador for Christ if we're viewing people the same way prior to conversion? So when you look at 16, once again, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't look at people the way that we used to. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, we did at one time, in other words. Paul is saying we did. We used to look at Christ in a way prior to our conversion, right? But yet we know him thus no longer. We don't view Christ the same way that we used to. Now that we're in the family of God, now that we're born again, now that we are in Christ, we view him as our Savior. Prior to conversion, how did, how did we view Christ? Well, he's a great teacher. How did you view Christ prior to conversion? Do you guys remember? Everyone is different on this as I'm trying to put this back on. One second here. Let's see if this will work again. There you go. Hang on, folks. We're having a little technical difficulty here. Apologize. There you go. Yeah, that's the transcription on. We have uh, someone back in, I think, Arizona watching us. And she reads lips and reads transcription. So this makes it easier for her. Okay, so now let me go back to the verse here. So let, let me read it one time, and hopefully we can get the force of Paul's um, passage here. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't look at anybody the way that we used to prior to conversion. Even though at one time we did, we've known Christ according to the flesh. And that's the idea of being uh, in the flesh as opposed to in Christ. Yet now we know him thus no longer. We don't look at Christ like that anymore. 17. If anyone is in Christ, and we are... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What are the new things? Our perspective. How we look at people. How we look at life. We view no one the way that we used to in the flesh. Okay, that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled, him, re reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So it's not just the pastor's job, it's all of us. Our job is to carry out the ministry of re reconciliation. When you get to 19, that is, this is what I mean, Paul speaking, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us, what? The word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, they were believers, obviously. They were reconciled already. But the idea here is he's giving them the concept and the thrust of the message of what it means to be an ambassador. We are, amb we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We urge you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then when you pair it with 18 and 19, that is God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. We call this the doctrine of imputation, right? Imputation in verse 19. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not what? Imputing their 
their sins or trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Is that my job only? That's ours. Reconciliation for all of us. The word of reconciliation. Now we are representatives. We are ambassadors for Christ as, through God, as though God were pleading through us. When you get to 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's that preposition in again. That only takes place when we're in him. And anybody can be in him so long as we're doing our job as an ambassador, which is getting people to understand that verses 18 to 20 are all about the switch of exchanging his righteousness for our sins. This is what you see here in verse 21. He made him who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. How, does it, how did that happen? He was credited on his body, on his person, 2,000 years ago, your sins and mine. The sins of the world were imputed to Christ so that we can have his righteousness upon faith alone in Christ alone. It has nothing to do with being good, as you all know. But our job is to reconcile the world to him. When you, get, when you read 18 to 20, it, for, it forms a wedge and it allows us to see, it summarizes his ministry as well as his message. Ambassadors do not speak in their own name nor their own authority. They communicate what they have been commanded to say. That's you and me. Their message is simple. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. That's our job. And when you look at 21, just that alone, the, this is the perfect exchange. The world is oblivious to this. He made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin so that we can have his righteousness. He did nothing to have sin. We did nothing to incur righteousness. Righteousness. It's a big switch right there, and it's all based on faith alone and Christ alone, right? So you have this verse 17 to 21 as a whole says nothing about sin, and that's why I was focusing on 17 earlier. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Is there anything from 16 to 21 that talks about sin? This has nothing to do with sin. This has everything to do with reconciliation. This has everything to do with being an ambassador. So that we can ultimately get people to have his righteousness. That's part of the gospel presentation. When you take 16 to 21 and you study it closely, you discover that this is what we're to represent. This is what we've been tasked to do as an ambassador. To let people know that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not crediting their trespasses or sins to them, and has committed to us, us, the believers only, to us the word of reconciliation. That's our job. So Pastor Gene talks about ambassadorship uh, 1 through 9. He has several comments about ambassadorship. Mine is taken simply from 2 Corinthians 5. Because it's loaded with information there. Just the one word, ambassadors, tells us we are representatives of him. And this is the message that we're to communicate. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses to them. Who's them? The world. And has committed to us, the believers, the word of reconciliation. That's our job. That's part of the church's job. You want to grow the church? We got to let people know about this. We got to advance the cause of Christ. Let them know that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But I'm shy. We're all shy to a certain extent, except Theron. We must do this. Why? We have been tasked as ambassadors. We've been studying phase two. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's phase one. Phase two. It's all about sanctification. But this is part of phase two. 
We are not only disciples, we are not only soldiers for Christ, we are ambassadors. When was the last time you heard someone talk about ambassadorship with your name tagged to it? Scott's an ambassador, Jerry's an ambassador, Mike is an ambassador, whether you know it or not. Because of what the scripture says, you are in Christ, that's your job. That is your job. We are to go out there and tell people this. This is why I love doctrinal studies like this, because it reminds us systematically, categorically, the key truths that we don't always get to hit on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, because it catalogs the doctrinal truths that we must know so that we could steward it on a daily basis. When, was, when will we be able to hit ambassadorship on a given Sunday? We're covering John 11. That's taking a little while now. And prior to that, we were, in we were in James. Did we hear anything about ambassadorship? No. But if you combine the two, you have an opportunity to study doctrinal subjects alongside the scripture, the word of God. You have the best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. So, being in Christ. My relationship with the world has radically changed, and we are now ambassadors. I'm saying that for all of us. So we must understand and take this seriously because this is what we have been tasked. We are ambassadors for Christ. Now, now then, the words now then form the conclusion of Paul's argument. Notice in verse 20, now then, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. You see that? It wedges the two together. Paul's it brings to conclusion Paul's argument. Now then, brings into center, verse, into center verses 20 and 21. Since it follows that God is reconciled, the conclusion is that he has commissioned ambassadors of reconciliation. The word there, ambassadors, is presbuo, meaning a representative or envoy, that's you and I. We are envoys of representatives of the person up on heaven. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We're envoys. So again, looking at now then, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. So the idea, this is Paul's argument, it brings into center verses 20 and 21, since it follows that God is reconciled, the conclusion is that he has commissioned ambassadors of reconciliation. That's us. That's our job. That's our task. One of our responsibilities. Now, the next section is available people. We kind of looked at this just briefly as well last week, and I have a few things to say here. I'll not read all the names here, but you know the names. Moses, David, Elijah, Isaiah, Esther, Mary, Paul. Those are available people. We're supposed to be available people, and I have something to say about available people. We are called epistles. We are the living epistles. You find this in 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 3, 1 to 3. Notice phase 2 again. Do we again, do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men, Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us. We started it, and you are the epistles. Paul's speaking. Written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of flesh. That is, of the heart. So what is Paul talking about here? The living epistles are individuals who are believers in Christ. So you and I are living epistles. What's the point, Freddie? Well, we're talking about, in Pastor Gene's book here, available people. Well, you are the available people if you avail yourself, but you're also known as the living epistle. You're a letter. You haven't been recorded yet in holy writ. But remember, the scripture says, 
Well, we know this is a fact growing up in doctrinal churches that the angelic conflict, the angels are watching us. Are they not? They're watching our every move. They want to see what we're going to do. They're curious about us. Well, your life as well as mine has not been recorded in Scripture, but we're called living epistles. So what does that mean? You can contribute to the giants of yesteryear, the giants of the Bible, Mary, Esther, Isaiah, and so on. But you have to be available. Why, would you be, why should I be available? Because you're a living epistle. It's not until you understand the significance of this will you live your life as unto God. We have some very anemic churches today. It's just, you know, uh, as long as the Lord loves you, praise God. God causes all things to work together for good. No! We've got to get away from that. We must recognize that the scripture is clear. We're ambassadors. We're people who are supposed to avail themselves. Are you available? That's what uh, the book is about here. This section on page 5. We're, Pastor Gene wants us to know the available people who made headway for God. Are you next? If you take seriously your responsibility as an ambassador, as an available living epistle, heck yeah! You should be able to. You should make a difference. What are we doing as a church, as a body of believers? We're supposed to be the pivot. Here we are praying about people in the Middle East, and we should. But you know what? It's only going to get worse. It's not who sits on the White House. It's what we are doing. It's not about who's there in office. It's about conversion, folks. It's about converting lives. It's not about who, if, who sits in president is going to say, well, it's more conservative. Or we can read our Bibles now. No. The truth is, if someone was conservative and Bible-believing in the office, that's good. However, the truth is, people have their volition. And it's not unless we impact them will they ever begin to say, what's the big deal? I don't care. I don't go to NCBC. What's the value? What's the importance of that? And it's not until we take seriously our responsibility as available people, as epistles, we're not going, we're going to lose people. They're not going to see the importance of getting into the Bible and having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're just going to say, I want to do what I want to do. It's no big deal. You can't tell me what to do, Vanessa. It's my, resp it's my job. It's, it's my life. Don't tell me about this Jesus. Darren, you want me to join the Good News Club? You, you stay in the Good News Club. I have my own Good News Club. But isn't that the truth? People have their own thing. You know what? Come join me on um, what's that on uh, Fridays in, in the bars? Happy a happy hour. That's my good news club right there. Very dangerous. Everyone knew it. Yeah, everyone, everyone here goes to the good. Uh, everyone knows about that uh, happy hour, huh? Well, that's. At least we're honest. <laughs> but the truth is, the world would, don't, would care less. Mike was the only one who didn't say anything. <laughs> that's right. He's part of the Good News Club, that's why. Well, the truth is, guys, you know, um, the world, we're living in a world that is topsy-turvy and is carefree. They don't care about God. And we're going to see these things in the Middle East coming here real quick. And I, I know they're already here. Foot is on the earth in our country. It's only going to get worse. You're hearing all these terrible things. Their babies are getting slaughtered. People are getting raped. It's only going to get worse. And the only thing that's going to make a difference is if the churches rally together and advance the cause of Christ. Slowly but surely impacting the lives because it's the word of God that's more powerful than any missile or any military power. It's the word of God that's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword or machine gun. And we have to utilize that now. 
And we, we have to stop playing church and get on the ball and start telling people, say, oh, well, come to NCBC. No, it's much more than come to NC, NCBC. Have you heard of Jesus Christ? Do you have a moment? I'd like to share Jesus Christ with you. You know, he so loved you, man. You, you look like you're having a bad day. Can I, can I have a few minutes with you? Look, I, I'm, pre, I'm being led to just talk to you about this, but you know what? I care about you. I know you don't believe me, but I do because I'm an ambassador of Christ. And you know what, maybe no one has said this, but you know what, he loves you. And if you acquiesce to his son, Jesus Christ, you can have life everlasting. And in fact, I'd like to invite you to church on Sunday. Got some fantastic people. It's a small, cozy group. I'll introduce you to Scott, Larry, David, Laura, Pastor Dan, Mike, well, maybe not Mike, yeah. Rick, Theron. We got a great group. That's how it starts. That's part of ambassadorship. That's doing what we're supposed to do. Representing heaven here on earth. We say our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. And where? Amen. Well, we got to bring that down here. We're not going to do that if we're just like, hey, go to church, go home. That's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to make the change. We're the ones who are supposed to make the change. That's only going to happen if we do something about it. So... We are ambassadors for Christ. Let me see if I can get to the proper slide now. The last page we stopped. Oh, we're on available people, page five. So that was what I wanted to say regarding uh, Pastor Gene's page five. Available people are just really people who are living epistles. That's you and me. We are living epistles. Yes, there's available people, but our names have not been recorded as of yet. But that's why I said earlier, the angels are watching us, are watching our every moves and learning about the grace of God by our actions. What we say, what we don't say. Are you impacting the world with your actions? You're the living epistle. And as such, we should live like that according to Holy Writ. We're a new creation in Christ. Live like it. Oh, but I don't believe in lordship salvation. I'm not saying lordship salvation. I'm saying, look, are you a believer in him? Then show it. If you love me, what does it say? Obey me. John 14, 15. Guess who said that? Jesus Christ. If you love me, obey me. Yet we're so quick to say God causes all things to work together for good. To those who? So that verse isn't going to happen to you unless you love God. So don't say, well, everything, honey, everything's going to be okay. No, it's not. It's not unless you obey God. How do we know? Jesus said that. If you love me, obey me. But today we just have Christians that are just so, well, you know, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. I'm born again, phase one. We got that down real well. But what are we doing with phase two? What are we doing post-church, after church, during the week? How are we representing as a living epistle? How are we representing as an ambassador of Christ, as a living epistle, as per my notes here, 2 Corinthians. Oops, it skipped again. Second Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. You are living epistles. That's our job, folks. That's our job. Pastor Gene calls it available people. I'm saying, I'm drawing from Second Corinthians so that you can see we're called living epistles. Not written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stones but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. That's our job. Yeah, but I'm not a pastor. Whoever said that you have to be a pastor to be a living epistle? Is that what the scripture says here? No. Your job is to reconcile the world to him. That's what we've seen thus far as an ambassador. Now we're only looking at available people. And by the way, available people is based on volition. 
Are you willing to exercise your volition positively? Are you positive to that? Lastly, he talks about biblical spirituality. Those online, we're on page 7 of the book. And I also have the slides up here. But if you have the book, I would encourage you to open to page 7. Just in case we blank out again. I'll try my best not to blank out on the screen. Page 7, Biblical Spirituality. The author talks about how in John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I take that to mean to be in fellowship with God and truth. The truth can only come from the living word, which is Jesus Christ, and the written word. The written word displays the majesty of the living word. The word of God coupled with the living word, you have a one-two connection there, one-two punch. So the word of God is the truth. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in doctrine, in spirit and in truth. Biblical truth that only comes from the word of God. Not something in Buddhism, not in Zoroaster, but in God's word. That's John 4.24 and that's Jesus Christ speaking there. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus Christ is the one who said this. The author says in point number one, at the moment of salvation, God the Holy Spirit indwells the body of the believer in Jesus Christ. Amen to that. That's true only to those who are in Christ. And if we don't, if we don't deal with section one, page four, page five, if we don't co incorporate that into our lives on a daily basis, if we're not an ambassador, if we're not available people, we're not acting as a living epistle, none of this will make sense. Nobody will be able to be spiritual without taking four or five into account. Now, we know these, point number one, two, and three. Objective, option, and objective of the spiritual life is to volitionally choose not to live in the energy of the flesh. Okay. So now I want to give you my two cents on spirituality. First of all, I've said in the past... To be a Christian, one has to be properly adjusted to Christ. That's all you have to do, right? Properly adjusted to Christ, you are therefore a Christian. I prefer believer in Christ because Christian is only used three times in the New Testament, whereas believer in Christ is used multiple times. But it's not a sin if you use the word Christian. You're welcome to use the word Christian if you want. You're just wrong. That's all. Just kidding for those online. So... Those in Christ, is a, those are people who are properly adjusted to Christ. How is one properly adjusted to Christ? What do you have to do to be properly adjusted to Christ? Wrong, wrong, wrong. Obey. Properly adjusted to Christ. Obey. No, not even obey. To be properly adjusted to Christ is to simply believe in Him. Properly adjusted to Christ is to believe in Christ. He who believes in me has everlasting life. Obey obedience comes after. That's phase two. You got that wrong, Scott. But you're still safe. Phase two or obedience comes after. You're properly adjusted to Christ at the moment of faith. But if you have not properly adjusted to Christ via faith, you're not a Christian. If someone was sitting here to my right and we, he wants to become a Christian, what do we say to him? What does he have to do? Believe, Believe in Christ. John 3.16, John 6.47, Acts 16.31. Scott? I heard, uh, use the term adjusting. I think that was a new word. Uh, word used on this right here. Mm -hmm. And when I hear, hear adjusting, we're always adjusting to what God is teaching us. Correct. Because adjusting to me means you're growing. You're, you're growing to uh, believe and trust in uh, things and growing and, and adjusting your life mm -hmm. to what you're, you're hearing from Christ as you're learning and mature and mature. Mm -hmm. I think that right through us by saying okay. adjusting means salvation only. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, that's fair. It, 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 first time we've heard that term. Yeah. Now it's hard to find. Yeah, that's, that's, you're right I don't there. Know if the justice is in the, in the Bible anywhere where it says adjust. So. Right, right. Well, a person who's rightly adjusted to Christ is called a Christian. Now, for spirituality, that's where I'm going with this. How does a person, what, happen, what does a person have to do to be properly adjusted to God the Holy Spirit? We talked about that earlier. Very good. Very good. That's proper adjustment right there. Yeah. Confess your sins, also known as? Okay, rebound. Simple, right? Confess, rebound, whatever term you want to use. It's properly, isn't that how we properly get adjusted to the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. You don't have to believe in Jesus Christ to be properly adjusted to the Holy Spirit. That's already taken place. So if I want to be properly adjusted to the Holy Spirit, therefore being spiritual, I have to confess my sins. Because no matter what I do, Unless I'm in fellowship with God, I have no power. I have no influence. He only enables me as I'm walking by means of the Spirit. And that only takes place when I'm in fellowship with God the Holy Spirit. I cannot do anything apart from God the Holy Spirit unless I first confess. What are the two negatives regarding the Holy Spirit? Do not grieve. Do not quench. So you can't grieve or quench the spirit or else you short circuit what? The power. You have no power. So to be a Christian you have to be properly adjusted to Christ and the only way to be properly adjusted to Christ is to believe in Him. That will allow you to be justified. Phase one. Don't you lose the power of Christ also? Yes. But, that, but properly adjusted to Christ is a one-time deal. And properly adjusted to Christ would also be related to being properly adjusted to the Holy Spirit. See? You can't have one without the other. So you must be properly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit, thereby allowing you to have freedom to speak to the Father Engage in a relationship or fellowship with God the Son. But if you grieve the Spirit, and if you're not properly adjusted to the power source, who makes it possible for the Shekinah glory that is resident in you to have fellowship, you have no power. You have no illumination. You short-circuit God the Father, God the Son, if you're out of, out of step with God the Holy Spirit, which is why we confess our sins. We always talk about confessing our sins because there's no way you could be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and not be in fellowship with God, Jesus Christ and God the Father. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Son and the Father. They're one and the same. So you need rapport beginning with God the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm saying to be, pro to be a Christian, you have to be properly adjusted to Jesus Christ and that adjustment takes place upon faith alone in Christ alone. To be properly adjusted to the Holy Spirit so that I can walk in power, so that I can have the Word of God illuminated in my life, that takes place when I name my sins, when I confess my sins. Okay? So going back to, let's go now into spirituality. Is that where we're at right now? Yes. So I said, rightly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit. The, the author talks about biblical spirituality, and we, we read a few things here. Now I want to give you my two cents. Spirituality is really about right thinking, proper thinking, rightly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit. If you look at Romans 8.1, this is what we're going to look at. Those online, we're looking at Romans 8, about 1 to 11. Verse 1 says, There is therefore no katakrima, condemnation, to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's verse 1. Or I'm sorry, 2. Now, for what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. That's verse 3. He condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5. Here it is. Here's the spiritual, this is spirituality for me. For those who live according to the flesh, what do they do? They're set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to what? The Spirit. What do they do? The things of the Spirit. What the things of the Spirit? They set their minds on the things of the Spirit. You see that? For to be carnally minded, verse 6, is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Are you seeing that in your Bibles? Okay, good. I want to make sure this, we're tracking on the same verse here. To be carnally minded is death. I don't take that to mean physical death only. It could be spiritual death. It could be a death, a lack of empowerment to deal with the struggles of the flesh as Paul struggles, struggled in chapter 7. Remember, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I'm good at. So we struggle with that. And Paul says, well, if you're going to live according to the flesh... You're going to watch that video all the time. You're going to set your minds on the things of the flesh. Don't think you're going to get away with it. The things of the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, they're consistently setting their minds on the things of the Spirit. Paul says, verse 6, To be carnally minded is death. You lose out on the empowerment. To be spiritually minded is two things. Life and what? Peace. Peace. So if you set your minds on the things of the Spirit, going to church, going to Bible class, reading your Bible, praying, when you set your minds on those things as opposed to the things of the flesh, you should experience internally life and peace. Because the carnal mind, verse 7, is enmity against God, for it is not subject... One second. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be the carnal mind. Verse 8. So then those who are, what does it say? The key word there is? No. Close. In. Are you in the flesh? How many of you are in the flesh right now? You're at the happy hour. Very good, Mike. Nobody in this room is in the flesh. Even if Mike's in the happy hour. Why is that? You're sitting here. Right. In NCBC. But let's be clear on this. Why am I saying nobody here is in the flesh? When... We have flesh. Does it say not relying? Very good, Mike. Does it say not relying on the flesh? Close. Very good. But I'm specifically saying there's nobody from Vanessa here to Pastor Dan. No one here is in the flesh. How can I say that? All of you are saved. So the preposition here is pointing to the flesh. So what does that mean in Paul's writing here in chapter 8? Who's in the flesh? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. We are not in the flesh. Look, what is it? Verse, verse 9, Vanessa? Can you read verse 9? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So we're not in the flesh because we are in the 
Please notice that going back and forth, we're not in the flesh, we're in the spirit. That's important to see. Observe what the text, observe what's there, observe what's not there. It doesn't say who sins. It doesn't say who's living in sin, going into happy hour with Mike. It says who are in the flesh. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So another rough translation of this is those who are unregenerate can never please God. Is that true? An unregenerate person cannot please God. Is that fair? Sure. True. Why is that? They don't have the righteousness of Christ. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing that they could do to please God. Can an unbeliever please God? No. Negative. They can't. There's nothing they can do to please God. Why? They have to first go through Jesus Christ. They're not going to please God because they're at enmity with God at the moment of birth. Have we not discussed this? They're in Adam. And we're trying, when we evangelize as ambassadors, what are we trying to do? We're trying to move them out of Adam into Christ. The position is every person, baby or adult, unless they acquiesce to Jesus Christ, they are positionally in Adam. That's the problem. That puts them at enmity with God. Every time they see a baby is born, every time that he sees an adult who is maybe doing good deeds, paying his taxes, crossing a, an older lady over the, over the, across the street, that doesn't mean anything to God. Why? Because as long as they reject Jesus Christ, they're at odds with Him. They need salvation, phase one. Does that make sense? So then, those who are in the flesh, those who are unregenerate, cannot please God. So your unbelieving friends, your unbelieving family cannot please God. Even if they give a large chunk of change to NCBC, that doesn't impress God at all. Money doesn't impress God. The only thing that impresses and pleases God is if someone acquiesces to Jesus Christ. That's why we are called to be an ambassador for Christ. That is why we are called to be available that is why I said we're living epistles. So that when you combine all of these truths together, you go home and say, we have a lot of work to do. Why? Because our family can't even please God. Our friends can't please God, no matter what they do, because they're not in the Spirit. Verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Watch this. If Christ is in you, the body is dead. Because of what? Sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, watch this. This is fantastic. Verse 11. David, could you read verse 11? But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Do you see anything here in verse 11? That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. All of it. <laughs> All of it. Okay. What stands out to you? What's so fantastic about this? The Spirit of Him. Very good. What, what's so fantastic about, about it? We'll give you life. Okay, don't we have life already, though? No, not spiritual. Spirit body. Okay. So, nobody here has spirit life? No. Or do we have it now? We have it now. So, look at this. This is very compressed in here. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your what? That resurrection power, Rick, is going to give you life to your mortal bodies. Is your body mortal or immortal? Is your life mortal or immortal? How about you, Mike? 
You have mortal body or immortal body right now? That's right. So it's mortal right now. So look at what it says. The power that raised, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, resurrection power, if that dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. Is that resurrection power supreme? Yuck yeah. That power is available to our mortal bodies, not our immortal bodies. Our mortal bodies, that speaks of now. It's not eschatological. He's not talking about end time resurrection like Martha, where her, her, her brother is going to rise. He's going to be resuscitated. And he's not talking about resurrection life here. This is not eschatological in terms of time. This is talking about now, here and now. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Who is that? God the Holy Spirit. If that spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in Jerry, dwells in Scott, dwells in David, Pastor Dan, Laura, Mike, Kareen, Rick, Theron, Vanessa, if that spirit raise it, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life or power to your mortal bodies. That's fantastic, if you ask me. That means all the struggles we have physically, we struggle with it. That's true. He, Paul says it in Romans 7. Things I don't want to do, I'm good at it. The things I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. The things I want to do, I can't. He struggles with it. But later on, he discovers how to accomplish this. So let's move forward. We've got two more hours. So... So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, those who are in the flesh in the spirit. So actually all we have to do is just go back here. It's right here in front of us. We read it already. It's a mindset. Remember I talked about our thinking. Those who live according to the flesh, what do they do? They set their minds on, set their minds on what? Things of the flesh, carnal things. If you've set your minds on the things of the world, the fleshly things, then you will experience death. You see that in verse 6? 5 and 6. Those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So to be carnally minded is death. A cessation of empowerment, as per Romans 7. You lack that empowerment that is readily yours as per ver verse 11. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are positionally in the flesh, the unregenerate, they cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Indeed, the spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anybody does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. He's not regenerate. He's not a believer. He's not born again. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And then verse 11, this is what we'll pull all the way back to verse 6 and 7 in the previous slide. The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus dwells in you he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life power to your mortal bodies maybe we can link that to the abundant life Jesus talked about I didn't come here just to give you life but to give life abundantly we can connect that with verse 11 the abundant life here the life that is empowered by the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. That's supreme power. So we should never say, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just human. We all are. We all struggle. We all struggle. We have weaknesses. We, we have sin issues. Nobody's um, impervious to sin. But when you look closely at what Paul says in Romans 8, 
That's my understanding of spirituality. When we're properly adjusted to God the Holy Spirit, we can have Him who raised Jesus from the dead give life to our mortal bodies so that we can be spiritual. That's spirituality, folks. It's a proper, aligned thinking with the Word of God. Right there and then. Pastor Gene talks about all these other things, and that's true, good reading, but for me, it's found and contained in Romans 8. Look at it closely. It's a mindset. What do you get when you set your minds on the things of the Spirit? Two things. Life and peace. Anybody need peace? There you go. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Think about it. If you're just sitting here online watching Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you're, gonna have, you're not going to have peace. You're going to be mad and frustrated and angry. You're like, oh my gosh, I wish I was in Israel. I'd show them. Right? We're just going to be angry. But if we're setting our minds on the things of the Spirit, we can have life and peace, definition and purpose in life because we are setting our minds on the things of the Spirit of God. So, this is where we will conclude. Any thoughts or comments? You guys like this? Yeah. Better than last week? <laughs> yeah, I think better, huh? Scott, better? When I have it on my iPad, it just it just lets me go. So, yeah, I I'll try a different iPad. Um, you have an idea? Okay. No, I I want to make sure we're good for this. Because, yes, Laura. The one thing that I I also in Second Corinthians uh, chapter five, verse right. sixteen to twenty one, the first scripture that you gave us. Especially in, in verse 17, mm -hmm. where it says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. creature. Or yeah, creation. Creature. Yeah. Uh, the old things have passed away, a whole new things have come. Yeah. And you said that was in relationship to people. Perspective, people. Per per yeah. yeah, in respect to people. Right. And I guess a lot of my question, how I had always learned that, correct me if I'm wrong, because yeah. I could very well be wrong is that the old things have passed away like the old covenant's gone. Yeah. You're no longer under the law. Yeah. The whole new things have come, which is filling the Holy Spirit. Right. And, the, and that's the new covenant. So the old things was... Do you see the word covenant, covenant there? No, but old things in mm -hmm. law... Yeah. I see that in Romans mm -hmm. all through it since he's talking to the Jews. Right. But I mean... I mean well, that, that is conceptually accurate and true because we have... But the, not in context here? In context, I see that as... In verse 16. Okay. Verse, yeah, read yeah, 16. Exactly, exactly. Because if you follow that, I, what you said is true. Biblical truth that you shared was true, right? The old covenant, we're no longer under the old covenant. The new covenant, new creation, new, cre new creature. Said, yeah. But it's following the previous verse, which is, can you read in it, Laura? Context, yeah, therefore from now on we recognize no man according to the flesh. Yeah. Even though we have known Christ. According See? to the flesh, we knew him in person. Yeah. Yet now we know him thus no longer. It means he's gone. Yeah. Well, well we, we look at him no longer like we, what we used to. Yeah, in the flesh. In the flesh. We're no longer looking at Jesus Christ or people. And Bec because we no longer see him in the flesh, mm -hmm. that he is a new creature. Mm -hmm. Because of that, he right. said, the old things have passed away. Yeah. And so now he's building on how we're going to be good ambassadors. Because if we're still thinking the way that we used to in our unregenerate state, we can't be good ambassadors. Right. See in the following verses there? Yeah. He's saying, look, if you're going to think the way that you used to, you know, you might be, uh, oh, he's, he's Filipino. Oh, you know those Filipino guys. No, I don't. You don't? <laughs> so he's just basically saying, you know, we don't look at people the way that we used to. That's how I see it. And everything you said, um, Old Covenant, New Covenant, that's all biblically accurate. But I think contextually, based on what he said there, it's about people. I would take it more in line with people. Okay. That, that's how I see it. Okay. Okay. Doesn't mean what you said was wrong. Doesn't mean what you said. Just means what I said was right. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Sam, this is getting way off time, but is it kind of like reflecting back to the way the Pharisees was looking at Christ? Yes, it, as being it, it, unbelievers, mm -hmm. you know, and not seeing him as the Messiah, and judging him, he never looked back at them. Well, look at look at who's saying that. That's Paul. Yeah. How was Paul before conversion? Yeah. Right. 
How did they view Christ? How did they view the church? So, yeah, I would say that's pretty consistent. But I, I see he's building on, well, you know, we don't look at people the way that we used to, like when I used to. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So, but all of these things we could pour into our theology and say, yeah, Old Covenant, New Covenant, we're under grace now. Text under ambassadors. In there. Yeah, see? But, but because we are ambassadors, I'm not sure how much in the Old Covenant they were ambassadors. No, nah, they weren't. No. Israel was uh, supposed yeah, to be, yeah, yeah but that's they the dropped point. the ball. Yeah, so that's yeah. Because, But, uh, right. see, this is... This is Excellent. Great, great uh, question, Laura. Okay. And this is what we're supposed to do in this particular kind right. of study. I, I appreciate this interaction back and forth. And so, anybody else have any thoughts, comments? If not, I'll turn it over to Vanessa so she can... <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, yeah, we'll call it a night. I just wanted to say that this is uh, the format now, and hopefully... This uh, will draw more people, and uh, yeah, we have a. Let's see, do we know how many people? We have nine people right now, so that's good. Let me see if I recognize. Oh yeah, hi Gladys, I see you there. Were you able to see the transcription? Mars, Marsha's there. Good, Gordon. Rudy, oh, very good. Some of these people are from California. Welcome, well, California. Welcome. So um, I'm glad you were able to join us, and uh, I'm sure you'll beat me up later on if there was something <laughs> that I didn't say. Oh, uh, Deacon Steve and Karen is online too. Very good. All right, well, let's close in a word of prayer. We are out of time in California. You're three-hour time difference there, so I'm going to respect the time. Thank you for joining us, and let's close in prayer. Father, as always, we are delighted when we can talk about you and boast about you and your word, and we can tell, Lord, that it is engaging just all on its own when we look at it carefully. And so, Father, I pray the things that we looked at tonight and studied together would bring you honor and glory, and that we would just uh, make application where necessary. We don't want this to just be academic. We want this to be life-changing so that we can impact others for the cause of Christ. Those without Christ, without hope, and certainly without salvation need to hear about your Son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this time. We ask all of these things through Christ's name. Amen.